قل اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم او الله سيك ذا ريفيوج فروم انزايتي اند غريف اند اس سيك ذا ريفيوج فروم لاك اوف سترينث اند ليزينس او الله سيك ذا ريفيوج فروم كاوينس اند نيغالينس او الله اس سيك ذا ريفيوج فروم بين اوفر باور باي ديث اند ذا اوبريشن اوف مين O oh Allah, suffice thou me with what is lawful, to keep me away from what is prohibited, and with thy grace make me free of want from what is besides thee. I ask this prayer in your last messenger's name, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Amin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. I bear witness there is no God but Allah who appeared in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. I bear witness the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is his last messenger, his exalted Christ. I bear witness the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan Muhammad Ali is his final reminder and warner in our midst today. And I bear witness that my beloved Queen Mother, Sister Mary Yah Muhammad is a beautiful, beloved black woman who's worthy and honorable in my sight. She's truly one who is worthy of praise and praise much. I greet you all in the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Ramadan Mubarak to the fasting Muslims of the Nation of Islam. And dear family, it was not and is not my intention to submit these videos during this holy month of Ramadan. I must address this because I know many of you may feel that I'm in violation and error for the mere submission of these videos but particularly during this time a time of peace a time of fasting but we must understand that the basic definition given to us for the meaning of Ramadan is intense heat and we are divinely taught that the principle and action and power of truth can be symbolically defined as intense heat because truth can be a very purifying element but we are also taught for I am no fool the truth out of season can cost a man his life. But at this point in my life, I'm compelled to know and believe and act upon the principles of truth knowing that we are living in and during a time, the time of truth, the time of the manifestation of truth. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages us in the Holy Quran Sharif to hurdle truth at falsehood until it knocks out its brains. Dear family, we can't be spooked out and take on the insidious mindsets of many Orthodox Muslims who believe that during the holy month of Ramadan the shaitan is tied up or chained, implying that during the holy month of Ramadan, that there will be no confusion, there will be no mixed feelings controversy, there will be no tension, no chaos, no arguing amongst Muslims, no war, no bloodshed amongst Muslims. But living in the real world, we know that is not true. For if it were, 
the self-destroying things that takes place amongst Muslims in every Islamic country, in every Muslim country, and even in America. The Muslims are divided even during this time. But we are divinely taught that Ramadan is simply a sign. A sign to warn us and guide us and instill in us that every day of our life is supposed to be in the spirit, in the practice of Ramadan. We are not just to abstain during this time. We are not just too fast during this time. But every day that we live, that we are blessed to live by Allah's permission, we should be living in a state of Ramadan, a mental and spiritual, cultural, holistic state of Ramadan. Not only are we fasting, but what is fasting? Fasting implies cleansing, purification, detoxification. For those of you who don't know, my name is Brother Muhammad. I reside in Jacksonville, Florida. I've been indefinitely expelled from the Nation of Islam by one of the sons of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, whom many of you call Rasul Hakim Muhammad, but who I respectively address as Russell, which is the alter ego that he assigned to himself when he alone knows that he has acted contrary to his righteous self. Dear family, I'm at a point in my life that I must fight for my right to be a member of the nation of Islam that I've longed to be a part of. I've earned the right, I've sacrificed for the right to remain a member of Allah's army. What has happened to me is not fair. And I know that many of you may say, but well, brother, life is not fair. Life may not be fair. But Islam is my life. And Islam is fair. Islam is fair because Allah perfected Islam for us. So in the nation of Islam, we are guaranteed justice and if a black man if a brother cannot find justice in the nation of Islam then the nation of Islam is no better than the Christianity that was given to us during slavery by our open enemies but stop for law Islam is perfect and in the nation of Islam, we have the provisional constitution for a reason. And no member has the sovereign right to evoke, to make any decisions concerning the welfare of another believer without consulting through the guidance of our provisional constitution. If, in fact, we are a nation governed by laws and bylaws. Expel, dear family, without a hearing. Expel, without a trial. So I'm fighting for my right. I'm fighting for my place in the nation or fighting for my place out the nation. So I'm taking this opportunity to present to you a series of videos, a series of letters. Letters submitted by myself, some last year, some as early as this year. 
letters that cause much controversy. Letters that have been mischaracterized. In my letters, and what you are about to hear is my deposition, dear family. And you, the believers, can be the jurors. But know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who appeared in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, is our Shaheed. This letter that I'm going to read addresses the principle of atonement. What has happened to me happened last year. It's almost a year old to have been indefinitely expelled. So what point, dear family, does atonement come in? Or do we not believe in the principle of atonement? Because of our condition, we cannot have Islam without the principle and the practice of atonement attached to it. So are we just talkers of atonement? Or do we truly believe in atonement? And if, in fact, we believe in atonement, then why have not ones reached out to me to atone with me? I am not an enemy of the nation of Islam. I am not an enemy of Allah. I am not one who is not due the love, the power, the principle of atonement but I guess we are just talkers and not believers of atonement dear family I am no fool I know that I'm taking on something that is bigger than me and the end thereof I do not know but uh, the devil plans and the law plans and Allah is the best of planners. Allah is the best of planners. I reached out to national headquarters to no avail. I've been indefinitely expelled. I've been ostracized. And I make no apologies for the timeliness, the timing of the submission of these series of videos. While many of you are blessed to be in the presence of one another, other fasting Muslims of our nation during this time, I don't have that luxury, that privilege, that blessing, because I've been indefinitely, forever expelled. Forever expelled. I cannot go from one city to the next because I'm in bad standings. So I offer you my deposition. And I shall read this letter, which was written last year, Saturday, October 20th. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I greet you all once again in the greeting, words, and actions of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Happy Holy Day of Atonement to all who truly appreciate the significance of this holy day. Introduced to us 17 years ago by Allah in the person of our leader, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan Muhammad Ali. Today is not October 16th. Yet, it is a day of atonement because we are taught that the day of atonement is not just on the 16th, but on every day that we live and are blessed to be able to atone for a wrong that we have committed. 
as we are taught, atonement is broken down as at one meant, meaning to be at one with, in unison with. We are further taught that in the process of atonement, the very first being we must atone with is the supreme being, our creator. The next being we must atone with is our individual self. And the last being or beings we must atone with is our brother, our sister, our fellow man, our family members, friends, and our community. Though we were introduced to this divine process 17 years ago, I'm sure many of us only hear about it or think about it once a year as we close in on October 16th of each year. Thus the collective commemoration of this holy day and its principles simply becomes ceremonialism and ritualism at most. Every member in the nation of Islam in the wilderness of North America and abroad is in need of atonement. But being that we all are in such need doesn't disqualify us from pointing out the wrong in one another. Because of our ignorance of scripture and mild indoctrination of religion, many of us misquote and misunderstand the biblical scripture about judging. For many times we are quick to condemn anyone who is judging us by referring to the Bible and warning that we are not supposed to judge people. That's not correct. For the Bible reads, be careful that ye judge, for with what measure ye judge, ye too shall be judged. Another thing that I've noticed in religion is that whenever someone has the heart, the spirit, the courage to expose the intentional and open sins and hypocrisies within their particular membership, the overwhelming and simultaneous response from the majority of those being exposed is that ain't none of us perfect. Ain't none of us without sin. See, that's what we say. As if this exploited and manipulated fact justifies our imperfection and sin and exonerates us of our imperfections, hypocrisies, and sins. Another biblical scripture that we typically used more so opportunistically opportunistically and in a very manipulative manner is that is the one that reads ye must first cast the log out your own eye before ye can cast the speckle out of someone else's eye typically this scripture is used when bona fide hypocrites excuse makers and folk cover-uppers are attempting and conspiring to prove their point that before one sinner can open his or her mouth to say anything about another sinner, he and or she must first deal with self by atoning and cleaning up self and getting self right. This implies that we must be sin-free in order to confront or address the faults in one another. This implies that because I'm imperfect and you are imperfect, neither one of us has the right to even attempt to edify one another. But as Muslims, we have rights over one another. As Muslims, we are taught that man's sharp is man like steel sharp and steel. We are not taught that perfect man sharpens perfect man or sinless man sharpens sinless man. So, in this teaching, the lesson to be learned is that it's the dullness and or the lack of luster of one another that will eventually lead to sharpening and shining of one another. One thing I've repeatedly witnessed here in Jacksonville, amongst the study group in particular, and amongst many other circles in general, is that whenever someone 
or some ones are being righteously condemned or exposed. The offended habitually attempt, attempt to hide behind the lyrics of Michael Jackson's song, Man in the Mirror, inferring that people need to look in the mirror first before they open their mouths in condemnation or point their fingers and blame towards someone or someone's other than self. Yes, this is a simple yet profound truth, but nevertheless, it doesn't nullify, exonerate, or eradicate the sin, fault, slackness, weakness, or wrongdoings of the offender. As Muslims, we are taught that we are mirrors of one another, which means that whenever we see one another, we are to be reflections of one another. We are to look at, at, and into one another to see if we are reflecting kindred spirits of one another. So as Muslims, when we look into one another and see the reflection of good in one another, then we know that the goodness that we see outside of self is simply a reflection of the potentialities of good that is inside of our nature. And likewise, when we look into that same mirror and see the reflection of evil, sin, and devilishment, we also know that the blemishes that we see outside of self represent and reflect the same potentialities of evil, sin, and devilishment that has been grafted into our natures to make us act other than self. If we are weak enough to not resist the influences of such. So as Muslims, it's binding upon us that we look at and into one another, that we observe one another, that we daily pray for the spirit of discernment to be able to discern the hourly and daily spirits of one another. Not for the purpose of finding fault with one another, as many opportunistically and biasly suggest, but for the purpose of attempting to edify one another and exhorting one another as Allah has commanded. Allah says, by the time, surely man is in loss, except for those who believe and do good and exhort one another to truth and exhort one another to patience. See, dear family, we are encouraged by our Creator to encourage one another in truth. But what happens when one comes along or raises up out of your midst who has looked into the eyes and hearts of those in your community, group, study group, mosque, to speak out about in behalf of and against the manifestation of what his eyes have seen. Not from a vindictive, spiteful, or envious motivation, but from the truth of what is. The church song that many harmoniously begin to chime is that he's looking for fault or he's trying to find fault. My response to this insidious mindset and belief system is that a man doesn't have to look for that which isn't hiding, nor does he have to find that which isn't lost. The manifestation of hypocrisy, slackness, weakness, and wrongdoings hasn't been hiding. It's been out in the open, arrogantly displaying itself with no fear of repercussion or reprimand. The problem is that those whom are guilty of manifested fault, unifying their sudden self-righteousness and in their hearts, as well as in secret counsel, they conspire together, wishing that the onlookers of them and their open faults will just close his or her eyes or turn his or her cheeks and just go along to get along and not to disturb what they have established. And here amongst the NOI study group in Jacksonville, Florida, this is the modest operandi. Wednesday, October 17, 
2012. I, like many of you, I'm sure, received an email notifying me of a NOI conference call or hookup with student regional assistant minister James Muhammad of Tampa. We are taught not to believe in coincidence, that things happen for a reason, that things don't happen for the same and or lack of reasons. To my surprise, this BYC weekly telephone hookup is not new. This was not the first week of it, but it was the first time I've ever heard anything about it. When this became known by listening, I immediately began to analyze the timing, coincidence, motive, reason of why I received an email and became aware of its existence this particular week. Student Regional Assistant Minister James Muhammad's message was themed after atonement. As a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, under the divine leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan Muhammad, I and we are taught to always analyze what's being said, how it's being said, the relevancy of it's being said, and to whom it may be presently applicable. He spoke indirectly, yet directly for those whom had ears to hear and minds to insightfully comprehend. Note, you know what's funny? It's when someone feels that another is talking about him or her. That someone, that someone is indirectly saying something against him or her. How he or she is condemned by others who try to discredit his or her perception by saying that's his or her self-accusing spirit. Question. What is the difference between the usages of the word, terms, self-accusing spirit, intuition, and the spirit and or voice of God within? If by Allah's will you can understand the differences of the usages of these three expressions, then I'm sure you can understand my point. Another saying that we traditionally use when trying to discredit someone for their perception is that we say, throw a rock into a pack of dogs and the one it hits will holler. What arrogance blinds us to realizing is that of course that particular dog is going to holler if he's the one that's hit by a rock and you will holler too if you were standing in a group with your friends or somewhere in peace alone and suddenly a rock or stone came flying out of nowhere and hit you upside your head. Moving on. As I listened to brother's personal exegesis on atonement, by Allah's permission, I abstracted and embraced what part of his telephone lecture was applicable to me. And I rejected that which wasn't. That is what a student, brother, soldier, and believer does. Only by giving my undivided attention can I attempt to weigh his spirit. I've only personally met brother and listened to him once. And this would be the second. So I couldn't risk my perception being tainted by emotionalism caused from me being a religious cheerleader. Yes, sir. And that's right. Because a NOI national or regional celebrity is speaking. The target of his lecture was primarily the believers within the seventh region. He spoke in general so as not to be obvious, which is appropriate at times. At this point, I will, by Allah's permission, attempt to summarize what portions of his exegesis stuck out to me the most. Number one, he addressed letters of complaints of disunity and disagreements within the seventh region. Number two, he stated, what do we look like being divided with one another when the enemy is plotting and threatening to kill Allah's servant, his family, and us who believe? Number three, he spoke about ones addressing their complaints and grievances being vindictive in spirit and using deceptive intelligence, which he further bore witness defines devil as we are taught by the final messenger of Allah. Number four, 
He categorized and generalized the complaints and grievances of believers as petty, small, and a bunch of BS. Number five, he addressed a complaint that he received about an incident where a believer threatened to do bodily harm to another believer. Number six, he stated that a man's or woman's perception is his or her reality in his or her mind. By Allah's permission, I will take his liberty extended unto me to elaborate on each of these particular points. No, I'm not trying to find fault with brother's exegesis. I'm simply trying to gain wisdom. Knowledge is one thing. And as we are taught, wisdom is another. Having a knowledge of what he said is one thing. Yet under or overstanding why he said the things he said is a level reserved for those who seek it. Furthermore, it's taking the time to understand why a man says what he says is the ultimate manner of respect you can give to a man who has spoken to you. Just as in my taking the time to write this letter, consider why I am writing this. points one and two. He addressed letters of complaints of disunity and disagreements within the seventh region. <clears throat> he stated, what do we look like being divided with one another when the enemy is plotting, threatening to kill Allah's servant, his family, and us who believe? In response, we are living during a time of division and a need for unification if ones properly overstand this. If believers are in a state of division, disunity, opposition, disagreement, that's only a manifestation of defects. And it's a clear warning signal that something is obviously wrong. Furthermore, Brother said it best in his exegesis when he stated that when there is a problem with the body, that the head, the leadership, is responsible. If we glance back 2,000 years ago, biblical history reminds us of a traitor who walked, supped, prayed, fasted, and soldiered with Prophet Esau. This traitor and enemy was known as Judas, and time presented him with the opportunity to betray Brother Esau to the enemies of Allah. This story alone is simply a revelation for us to be reminded that everyone who claims Master Farad Muhammad, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan Muhammad is not of them. In the angel, we are reminded of another account when Esau spoke about the return of the Son of Man, that upon his return the first place he will come to divide is in his own house or home because everyone who claims to be of him is not of him. If we truly understand what we are members of, and if we truly believe that our leader, his family, and even our own lives are at imminent risk right now as I compose this letter, then division and disunity and opposition is a necessity if rightly understood in order to inspire us to tighten the ranks, to uphold the restrictive laws of Islam, to undoubtedly and unquestionably make our word bond, to ensure that all Judases, hypocrites, and lip professors are exposed and ostracized from amongst those who are at least striving to be righteous. All of them justified to speak on in, on is the condition of the NOI study group here in Jacksonville. And with that being said, I must bear witness that the body of the study group is sick, is hurting, in need of healing, in need of atonement. And this is why the condition of division that brother spoke on is taking place here in particular. Point number three. He spoke about ones addressing their complaints, grievances, being vindictive, in spirit and using deceptive intelligence 
which he further bore witness, bore witness defines devil as we are taught by the final messenger of Allah. In response, if that is what a brother has perceived, then I must honor him with the usage of his own words, that what a person perceived in his or her mind is his or her reality, according to the word of Allah expressed in his last revelation. He clearly has authorized any man or woman to speak who feels that he or she has been wrong. Yet it is man who counterattacks and attempts to discredit a person's personal hurt and pain by concluding that he or she is being vindictive in his or her expression of truth. Because for whatever reasons or lack of reasons, Man may be disconnected, insensitive, unconcerned with the problems that another man or woman may have. Yes, I agree with brother that many may opportunistically use deceptive intelligence in revealing and or expressing their version of truth. I further agree with brother concerning what the messenger taught us about devil being defined not just in physical form as the white man, but as one who uses deceptive intelligence to rationalize disobedience to Allah. But I will not be selective in my usage of the messenger's teachings in order to biasly exalt and prove my point. Meaning, the messenger also taught us that a devil is one whose wickedness is not confined to him or herself, but affects others. So how many of us who claim that we believe are indicted by this definition? What's sad and a contradiction is all of us in all of this is that a manifested devil can cause grief and discomfort to a believer. And if that believer speaks out in defense of himself or to express his grief and pain, that believer risk being labeled a devil. What type of insidious mindset is this? So in essence, what you have is devils casting out devils. And biblically speaking, that just doesn't happen. What's sad about many of us who claim to believe is that none of us have a problem when the leader admonishes us. But when we admonish one another, we refuse to have the humility to accept it out of love. That's because we absolutely refuse to believe in the personage of Allah in one another. We refuse to bear witness to Allah's gifts being bestowed in one another. And intentionally or unintentionally, we see no divine value in one another. Point number four. Minister James, he categorized and generalized the complaints and grievances of, of believers as petty, small, and a bunch of BS. In response, when something doesn't directly concern you, and you are not adversely affected by the causes of something, then it's very easy to speak in a manner and spirit to discredit or belittle another person's personal hurt and pain. When you are disconnected from the hurt, pain, suffering, oppression of your brother or sister, then it's easy to be unempathetic and unsympathetic to what they are going through. And it's easy for you to feel that what your little no-name, nameless, faceless brother or sister is going through is a waste of time. The Messenger of Allah didn't take any of the letters or grievances from the believers as petty, small, bullshit, or a waste of time. Respectfully, I feel that this was not the most proper response to a hurting, sick, Disease nation that's in desperate need of atonement. 
when many who are hurting and weak hear such a response. In indirect response to their hurt, pain, and grievance, it will only make them drop their heads, curl up, and go back into the quiet darkness of their corner or room and suffer silently with their sickness, hurt, pain, and grievance, and further feeling ashamed for ever having the temporary courage to finally speak out. Such a response clearly implies that a believer doesn't have the right to be dissatisfied. The law of dissatisfaction dictates that one has the right to be dissatisfied when conditions of discontentment exist. Such a response doesn't encourage dissatisfied and mistreated believers to speak out. Instead, it's a sign that their cry or their plea for help has landed on deaf ears, a silent tongue, and that they better not ever open their mouths again. They better just shut up and deal with the reality of what is, and furthermore, believe that the, that the divine expectation of freedom, justice, and equality in the nation of Islam is more so theory than actual practice. Dear family, I know it's not simply theory. I know it is practice. And I don't wonder what our leader would think if he heard believers' grievances being addressed in such an insulting manner. For I know what our leader would think and such belittling sentiments wouldn't be his Islam. Number five, he addressed a complaint that he received about an incident where a believer threatened to do bodily harm to another believer. In response, brothers addressed to this was spirited. It has so much spirit that I can only conclude that this particular matter was directly investigated for actual validity by him, that all parties involved had an opportunity to present their case, and that moat religion didn't supersede the application of common sense and the natural law of things. Furthermore, I pray brother didn't rely upon the white male's rationale in deciding things from a, from a majority rule perspective, meaning that if the majority have stated things one way, that the minority offender is automatically presumed guilty. Referring back to brother's own words, what a man or woman perceives in his or her mind is his or her reality. Now, let's rely upon Allah's guidance. Allah has already revealed in the Holy Quran for the believers to fight with those who fight with them. Allah has revealed to the believers to fight those closest to them in truth. Allah has warned the believers never to fight in the sacred precincts but whomever fights us therein to fight them and to slay them where we find them. When you clearly understand that we are living during the time of the manifestation of all defects, then we must understand that believers, niggers, hypocrites, lip professors, Judases, charlatans are all walking, fasting, praying, eating, and soldiering in the community together. And when conditions like this exist, there is bound to be infighting, quarreling, confusion, stagnation, and division. It is imminent, for there is nothing new under the sun. Dear family, I can talk like this and about this because I have been in a situation like this recently, as a matter of fact. I'm not sure a brother was speaking indirectly about me, but please allow me the liberty to speak directly about me. I was personally involved in three separate incidents of potential physical confrontation with other FOI. In all incidents, I was the only one reported to regional for threatening to do bodily harm. I was the only one criminalized and demonized. Well, what the reporters of the incidents reported is biasly their collective reality because it is the bias and deceptive perception in their minds. So who am I to argue 
or challenge them. As Muslims, we are taught never to be the aggressor in words, actions, or deeds. But once you have been aggressed upon in either words, actions, or deeds, then Allah and the law of preservation has authorized you to have the born right to defend yourself against the slander of any enemy, the mischaracterization of any enemy, disbeliever, and even ones closest to you who have turned devil. In the enemy's media, he misportrays innocent Muslim men and women and children in sovereign lands who rise up to defend themselves against the onslaught of genocide perpetrated upon them by America and its allies. As terrorists, they are labeled. But if you ask the innocent and defenseless ones in those countries, who was the terrorist? They will point to the invaders and not the freedom fighters who are sacrificing their lives to preserve their sovereignty and humanity. The minister teaches us that one nation's freedom fighter is another nation's terrorist. So on a smaller level, and to simplify the relevancy of this point, I've been threatened on three different occasions, and each time, right or wrong, my unapologetic position was and still is to defend myself, because I knew then, and I know now, that I was in conflict with common street niggas, who when convenient posture as believers and FOI. This is not deceptive intelligence to rationalize or justify anything. If I am wrong, then I am man enough to be wrong, man enough to accept my wrong, and man enough to stand alone in my wrong, and man enough to atone for my wrong. Brother spoke about fellow believers atoning and reconciling our differences. The first thing is that all parties must absolutely be willing to atone. Before ever hearing the leader said, my very nature told me that there are some things that are unatonable. For instance, you can't beat, rape, or murder my mother, daughter, sister, or wife, then come to me seeking atonement and reconciliation. That's not the natural order and or law of things. The atonement the perpetrator is righteously entitled to is the law of Moses. A life for a life, a two for a two, an eye for an eye, period. Yes, Allah is the most forgiving and the most merciful, but we being his vicegerents are simply servants of his divine attributes. Are the conditions, relations here in Jacksonville at a point of being unatonable and unreconcilable? Time dictates the agenda, and it is time that will manifest an opportunity for this answer to be revealed. Point number six. He stated that a man or woman's perception is his or her reality in his or her mind. In response, this is simply another insidious way or a politically correct way to call someone else crazy, insane, out of touch, or disillusioned. The statement is profoundly true, yet many, but many may use it. Along with how many other expressions are misused. I listened to brother, giving him my undivided attention. And while others were presenting comments and questioning during the Q&A segment, I took the liberty to pose a question to Brother James Muhammad. Thus my question read, the Holy Day of Atonement was presented to us 17 years ago, and in so doing, we were taught that the Day of Atonement is not just one day, but it's every day, which means that we are living during the days of atonement. So being that we are living during the days and time of atonement, in the days and time of separation, how are we to know which process to apply? Meaning, 
Should we as believers be involved in the process of atonement or involved in the process of separation? This was not my statement question verbatim, but I'm more than sure it is close to it. Student regional assistant minister gave a beautiful response and next to Jesus to my question, but in so doing he failed to mention the biblical parable of the wheat and the tear. See, there was no atonement between the wheat and the tear. Eventually, there was separation. See, while I was listening attentively to brother, I still, I still felt I needed to weigh his spirit some more. So I was inclined to present my question, hoping that his response to my question would provide me with a better opportunity to weigh his spirit. And all I would say is and all I would say is that it did. All praise is truly due to Allah who appeared in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. Dear family, if I am the problem here, if I am institutionalized and still need to readjust to this larger prison from coming out of an aggressive and hostile smaller prison, if I am suffering from psychological problems that warrants me needing to have engrams exercise or exorcism out of me, then I humbly welcome whomever to prove it. Prove it! And you, the local membership, nor the regional won't have to separate from me. For I will submit to the common decency of my own nature and remove myself. I'll separate from the group myself so that the NOI study group here in Jacksonville will progress because the cause of our nation is bigger than me or any other individual. In closing, by Allah's guidance and permission, I will conclude with Allah's guidance from the Holy Quran, as well as Allah's guidance from our leader, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. The following revelations from Allah to his messenger, and Allah's guidance through the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan Muhammad, are here for you to ponder its relevancy. Holy Quran, Surah 2, Ayahs 8 through 16. Surah 58, Ayahs 14 through 20. Surah 63, Ayahs 1 through 6. Now I shall read quotes by the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan, Muhammad. Moses kept his community together until he went to the mountains to receive the law. Then Satan upset his community. After he went up again into the mountains to die, Joshua did well, but he could not hold the community together. The community that is called Jewish is a divided community today. The community is beset by problems caused by deviation from the laws, statutes, and commandments of Allah that he gave them through the mouth of their prophets. What causes the division among us? Envy? And envy is the most irredeemable emotion in the human being. When one person envies another, that spirit is the spirit of Satan. Envy is in the church. Envy is in the mosque. Envy is in the synagogue. Envy is in the world. Satan runs any place where envy is the order of the day. I know there are sincere Muslims all over the world as there are sincere Christians who want the purity of that faith and really are disturbed at what they see and hear going on in the name of Jesus. That means if we are doing those things, we've got to clean ourselves up. Jesus said, wash and be clean. Dirty people can't claim Jesus. I don't mean just dirty on the outside. The real filth and the real dirt is the dirt that is on the heart of those who claim to worship Almighty God. Don't you want to see a change in the people in your community, synagogue, church, or mosque? That when you walk among your own people that claim they believe like you, that you can feel the presence of God? Another quote by the minister. Now, when we say a few good men, the word few means not many, a small number, 
a minority group, a select group. The word good according to Webster means suitable to a purpose. A lot of people are suitable for some purpose and they are effective. They may be efficient. They may produce favorable results and the results may be beneficial. But they are not yet a few good men because good is not what we define. Good is what God defines. The scripture teaches that God is good. Well, if God is good, then it is only he who sets the standard or gives the yardstick by which we measure what is good. Unfortunately, we don't use that yardstick and that is why there are only a few. Now, there are a lot of people who are good to you, but who are not good because we don't use the yardstick that God uses. Hypocrites can look good and even do some good that affects good, but they are not good people. Isn't that something? There are a lot of people whose apparent acts of good are tainted by ill motivation. How in the world do we get to be a part of that select group that is so few? I hope that God will allow us to ascend that ladder to be among the select few because God doesn't need many to turn the world around. Sometimes he just needs one good man. Brothers and sisters, I'm still quoting the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. From here on out, dear family, I'm quoting the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Brothers and sisters, there are those in religion who claim religion that are very irreligious. You have these kinds of hypocrites in Judaism, in Islam, in Christianity, and in other religious persuasions where people pro profess the belief in a religion and then do the opposite. They use the good name of their religion for wicked practices which besmirches the name of the religion. There are Muslims who are doing things that we may say are un-Islamic. And there are Christians who claim Jesus Christ but are doing things that Jesus would not approve of. And there are those who call themselves Jews who are doing things that the prophets of God sent to the children of Israel, starting with Moses, that these prophets would not approve of. It's blasphemy to say you are a Jew, Muslim, follower of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad under the divine leadership of the honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan Muhammad and not act in accord with the laws, statutes, and commandments of God because you are telling the world that you are the choice of God. But then you use the wisdom of God to build a world in opposition to God. May I humbly say religion, as it is being preached and practiced, is a failure. Not some religions, but all of them. Don't be displeased with me. We must judge the failure and success of religion by how effective we are in transforming human life. Not judging religion by how happy the people are over our preaching or the song that we sing or the prayer we say and then the people go back out in that world to be the same as they were before they came to see that house of worship when Jesus came on the scene there were many preaching the law but Jesus said oh ye hypocrites see that's a tough word who wants to be called such an ugly name but Jesus said you have whited sepulchres, and in them are the bones of dead men. The churches and the mosques and the synagogues, they're white, meaning they're white on the outside. But the people on the inside are like the bones of dead men and dead women. What does this mean? If our religion is only for the walls and the people within them, then we have failed them. If we don't make beautiful people to come in and out of that building doing the will and the work of God, then all of this means nothing. This is why the Bible says that you have to become wise to be able to discern the spirit because the outward look is not important. If it is the spirit that you must discern because Satan, the Bible says, is able to transform himself into an angel of light. You cannot want to be righteous and hang out with people who do not want what is right. 
If you want to be right, 